Good afternoon. It's Friday, the 15th of May. I'm Aaron Viner, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. We open with the new government, which is the 34th in the nation's history. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held the first cabinet meeting of his new government shortly before midnight last night after the Knesset approved the ministerships with a vote of 61 to 59 during a raucous evening session. Raising a toast to his 28 minister coalition, Netanyahu expressed his hope that from this moment on, disagreements would be left outside the room where the cabinet would focus on what is good for all the nation's citizens. He went on to say that the cabinet would work with determination, responsibility and vigor in the face of all attempts to test the nation's borders and security from both near and far. He added that his government will continue to promote a diplomatic settlement with the Palestinians while upholding the vital interests and security of all of the nation's citizens. And here now is a look at the government. For the time being, Prime Minister Netanyahu will also hold the foreign affairs, health, communications and regional cooperation portfolios for himself. Moshe Yalon will continue as defense minister. Israel Katz will also retain his portfolio of transportation and road safety and will in addition assume the intelligence ministry. And Yuval Steinitz will be staying on as the minister of national infrastructure, energy and water. Moshe Kahlon is the new finance minister, Ayelet Shaked is now the minister of justice, and the Likud Sylvan Shalom will be deputy prime minister as well as the minister of the interior. Naftali Bennett will now hold three portfolios for education, Jerusalem and diaspora affairs, while Aryeh Derry will replace Bennett as minister of economy, and Chaim Katz becomes the new minister of welfare and social services. Deputy Health Minister Yaakov Litzman will serve as the de facto head of the ministry. Yoav Gallant receives the Housing and Construction Ministry, and Uri Ariel is the new Agriculture Minister. Even though Avi Gabay is not a member of Knesset, he has been appointed to be the Minister of Environmental Affairs. Zev Elkins holds both the Strategic Affairs and Immigration Absorption portfolios, and David Azulai is the new Minister for Religious Services. Miri Regev will take the Culture and Sports Ministry and Gila Gamliel, the Ministry for Senior Citizens, Minorities and Gender Equality. Danny Danone is now Science Minister and Yariv Levin becomes the Minister of Tourism and Public Security. And while Netanyahu is technically the serving Foreign Minister, Deputy Foreign Minister Tsipi Hotbeli will basically serve as its head by making any major decisions that affect the nation's diplomatic corps and managing the daily staff work. Benny Begin and Ofer Kunis will serve as ministers without portfolios. The five deputy ministers are Ayub Kara, Rabbi Eli Ben Dahan, Mayor Porush, Yitzhak Cohen, and Meshulam Nahari. While conspicuous, conspicuously absent from the cabinet is Likud's number two, Gilad Erdan, who declined the prime minister's offer to become the public security minister after his demand for the foreign ministry portfolio was rejected. Clarifying his decision to remain outside of Netanyahu's fourth government, Erdogan today wrote on his Facebook page that the apparent character of the new cabinet is what convinced him not to join. The former communications minister said that despite his hope of continuing to serve in the government, the proposal presented to him by the prime minister failed to provide him with the flexibility or tools necessary to bring about real change. He stressed that this is a difficult day for him and his supporters, but pledge to continue serving the state of Israel faithfully as a member of Knesset. The Knesset swearing-in ceremony had to be postponed for two hours to allow the Prime Minister time to assign his Likud party MKs the remaining ministries. During his opening address, Netanyahu called the current electoral system ineffectual and vowed that the new government will seek to improve it. He pointed out that this is the country's 34th election in 67 years, meaning that, on average, there's a change of government every two years, which he said is too taxing for leadership and the public. The holding of a general election and subsequent assembling of a government takes six months at least, Netanyahu told the legislators, as he also criticized the current system for encouraged, encouraging exaggerated demands by parties as well as individuals. Later, when Netanyahu announced the intention of his new government to pursue peace, opposition MKs laughed at him. Arab members of Knesset then played an audio tape of Netanyahu complaining about the high turnout from their community's citizens during the March 17th election. They were then either expelled or walked out of the plenum on their own accord after further heckling the prime minister. 
During his address, Netanyahu thanked Tsakhi Negbi for accepting the chairmanships for the coalition and the Knesset Foreign Affairs Defense Committee. This came as an apparent surprise to Negbi, indicating the disarray in which the government was formed. And he announced that he not only did not accept those positions, but that the prime minister's statement was made without his knowledge. Likud party officials later offered a clarification that Hanegbi will replace Ofer Akunis as a minister without portfolio about a year from now. When taken, taking to the podium for his own address, opposition leader Isaac Herzog rejected Netanyahu's offer to consider joining the government. He went on to deliver a fiery speech, charging that the prime minister formed a circus and not a government. Herzog slammed the new coalition as hopeless, which he said lacks vision and a working plan. He then told Netanyahu that his coalition partners had pickpocketed him by extracting wide-ranging concessions on policy and in the form of cabinet positions. He also said that Netanyahu's ideological forefathers, Zev Jabotinsky and Menachem Begin, would have been ashamed of him for having created a government at any price just to hold on to power. Saying, your way is not my way, Herzog told the Prime Minister that his own path is that of the labor movement that founded this country. And without officially acknowledging the new government, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas laid out conditions for resuming peace talks with Israel. Speaking in Ramallah last night, Abbas said that the PA will only return to the negotiating table if it is established in advance that the talks will conclude within one year, during which an official timetable will be set out for an Israeli withdrawal from the territories by the end of 2017. In addition, Abbas is demanding an end to settlement construction and the release of all Palestinian prisoners detained before the signing of the Oslo Accords, who were scheduled for release in 2014. He went on to accuse the previous Israeli government of thwarting attempts by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry to revive the peace process and stress that the Palestinians will continue to seek recognition from the international community toward the achievement of their goals. In other news, speaking from his Camp David summit with leaders of the Gulf Cooperation Council, U.S. President Barack Obama recognized Israel's successful formation of a government, but noted that several of the Knesset members openly opposed the establishment of a Palestinian state, and he again stressed the importance of reaching a peace agreement. I continue to believe that a two-state solution is absolutely vital uh, for not only peace between Israelis and Palestinians, but for uh, the long-term security of Israel as a democratic and Jewish state. Uh, and uh, I know that a government has been formed that uh, contains some folks who, who don't necessarily believe uh, in that premise, uh, but that continues to be my premise. Uh, and since we're up here at Camp David, I think it's important to remind ourselves of uh, the degree to which the, a very hard peace deal that incre required incredible vision and courage and tough choices uh, resulted in what's now been uh, a lasting peace uh, between countries that uh, used to be sworn enemies. Uh, and Israel's better off for it. I think the same would be true if we get a, a peace deal between Israelis and Palestinians. That prospect seems distant now, uh, but uh, I think uh, it's always important for us to keep in mind uh, uh, what's, what's right and what's possible. During the summit, Obama made an ironclad pledge to the anxious Persian Gulf nations that America will help them to ensure their own security and even pointedly mentioned the potential use of military force. The U.S. leader also offered his assurance that the long-term nuclear accord that his administration is trying to achieve with Iran would not leave the Gulf Cooperation Council nations in a more vulnerable position and that the U.S. Yeah. would work to deter yeah. and confront mm -hmm. any external threats posed to the territorial integrity of each GCC state. Washington has also vowed to bolster security cooperation with the Gulf on counterterrorism, maritime security, cybersecurity, and ballistic missile defense. Obama convened the two-day summit in an effort to calm the Arab nation's fears that Iranian aggression in the Middle East will only surge after there has been a massive influx of money when international sanctions are lifted after the signing of a nuclear deal. 
While the president acknowledged those concerns, he said that he believes that Tehran's focus will instead be on shoring up its own economy that was badly hit by the punitive measures meant to force its atomic compliance. After he and his top advisors walked the Gulf nations through the emerging deal in detail during private meetings, the president said that while the Gulf leaders hadn't been asked to sign on to the bottom line to approve the framework accord with Iran, they did agree that a comprehensive, verifiable solution that fully addresses the regional and international concerns about Iran's nuclear program is in their own nation's best security interests. The discussions we had today were candid. Uh, they were extensive. Uh, we discussed not only the Iranian nuclear deal uh, and the potential for us to ensure that uh, Iran is not uh, obtaining a nuclear weapon and triggering a nuclear arms race in the region, but we also discussed uh, our concerns about uh, Iran's destabilizing activities in the region uh, and pledged cooperation around how we can uh, address those in a cooperative fashion, even as we hope uh, that we can uh, achieve uh, the kind of peace and uh, good neighborliness uh, with Iran that I think so many of the countries here seek. Uh, we discussed the conflict in Syria. We discussed the situation in Yemen. Uh, we discussed countering uh, violent extremism uh, and specifically uh, what additional work we need to do uh, with respect to Daesh. Uh, and I was very explicit, as will be reflected in the joint statement that we re uh, released, uh, that the United States uh, will stand by our GCC partners uh, against external attack and will deepen and extend the cooperation that we have uh, when it comes to uh, the many challenges uh, that exist in the region. For their part, the Arab leaders have been voicing cautious optimism after meeting with Obama. The Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, said that the GCC welcomes the agreement with Iran, which they hope will be a key factor to stability in the region. Saudi Foreign Minister Adel Al Jubeir was less enthusiastic, saying that while his nation welcomes any deal to prevent a nuclear Iran, it's still too early to know if the final agreement will be acceptable because many details do remain unknown, as well as if Tehran will accept all the necessary obligations. Obama downplayed the split between those two countries and said that it is expected that some will reserve final judgment until the completion of the agreement in June. And meanwhile, as if to underscore the concerns of the Gulf states, an Iranian naval patrol fired on a Singapore-flagged commercial ship in the Persian Gulf yesterday in what American officials say was an apparent attempt to disable the ship over another financial dispute, this time involving alleged damage to an Iranian oil platform. The incident took place a bit south of the island of Abu Musa, just inside the Gulf, and comes just weeks after Iranian forces intercepted a Marshall Islands flag, Marsk Tigris, over similar claims on April 28th. Meanwhile, the U.S. Congress is sending Obama a bill that would give lawmakers the power to review and potentially reject the long-term nuclear deal with Iran. The House overwhelmingly passed the deal by 400 in favor to 25 against, following preceding approval by the Senate. The president has already announced his willingness to sign the legislation after retracting his earlier threat to veto it. Ten Palestinians were reportedly injured in the West Bank a short time ago when clashes erupted after demonstrators threw rocks at IDF soldiers who were escorting about 1,000 Jewish worshippers to visit Joseph's tomb in Nablus. The condition of Benjamin Frankel has been stabilized following moderate injuries that he sustained in the Palestinian terror attack near the Gush Etzion settlement of Alon Shavut yesterday. The 25-year-old victim was waiting at a hitchhiking post with three teenagers who were also lightly injured when Mohammed Arfaya drove his vehicle into them. The 22-year-old Hebron resident was arrested shortly after the attack by Shin Bet security services and has reportedly confessed to having deliberately carried out the attack. Just over a year ago, the assailant was released from prison after being convicted on weapons possession and throwing rocks at vehicles. Shin Bet officials are now investigating whether Palestinian incitement on the Internet and social media sites may have inspired Arfea to launch his attack. Indictments have been filed against seven suspects involved in the Ronell Fisher corruption scandal. The defendants include the prominent attorney and journalist, as well as retired police superintendent Iran Malka, 
Former Tel Aviv District Prosecutor Ruth David and four Fisher's clients who were charged with paying him bribes to obtain information about cases against them or to become close to police so that those investigations would be closed. Everyone under suspicion faces a number of charges that include bribery, fraud, breach of public trust, money laundering, and obstruction of justice. Malka was then working in the elite police investigation unit, and he has confessed to most of the charges against him involving his alleged passing of classified information to Fisher in exchange for large sums of money. Ruth David is suspected of obstructing justice in two different cases, including the receipt of assets obtained through the commission of a felony after becoming a partner in Fisher's law office when she retired from public service. Four premature babies born in Nepal through surrogacy and their Israeli fathers have safely been brought to the country. The young families were in the Asian country when the 7.3 magnitude earthquake hit it earlier this week following the devastating tremor that rocked the country less than three weeks ago. A special delegation of the Magen Davida Dome Emergency and Disaster Service helped to bring the families home, including one infant who required an incubator. All of the babies have been taken to the Schneider Children's Medical Center in Pedoktikva for further treatment and monitoring. The Foreign Ministry hosted the fifth global forum in combating anti-Semitism in Jerusalem this week, where the executive director of the National Coalition Supporting Eurasian Jewry, Mark Levin, discussed the situation in Ukraine with IBA's Eli Wogelenter. It's a complicated situation right now for the Ukrainian Jewish community because on one hand, they've never had it better. Uh, they, there are more Ukrainians who are accepting their Jewish uh, fellow citizens as Ukrainians. But we don't know if this is a, you know, a long-term development or it's something uh, out of need. Because right now, the challenges that this Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian population face are not only what's going on in the eastern part of the country. It, it's a double whammy. They have a, an economy that's spiraling out of control, and they're trying to fight a war at the same time. And it's a war. It's not a conflict. There are heavy casualties being inflicted on both sides. And this has an impact on Jews. We estimate that there might be between five to 10,000 Jews still in eastern and southern Ukraine living under very difficult situations. Are the Jews in eastern Ukraine looking to move west? Or are they looking to make Aliyah? Most of the Jews have moved west. There's been a dramatic and significant, significant increase in Aliyah and emigration from Ukraine to Israel and elsewhere. But the bulk of the population, have, bulk of the Jewish population, have moved westward. We anticipate that there'll be another. If conditions remain the same, then we anticipate uh, Aliyah increasing probably at the same rate it did last year. Which, which is a was, big jump from the year before. A, right. It was almost a 40% increase. The numbers went from the low thousands to the mid thousands. And if conditions stay the same, we expect that number to, uh, to, to increase. And what's the situation between the Jewish community of Ukraine and the Jewish community of Russia, whose countries are fighting a war? That's also complicated. You know, you have, uh, you have communities that have worked closely together for several decades now, and there's tension. Uh, you, have, uh, you have a Ukrainian Jewish population that's almost fully invested and supportive of their government. At the same time, you have a Russian Jewish community that uh, uh, sees what's, what's going on and uh, um, you know, has has supported their government as one would expect and that obviously has caused some friction between the two communities we hope it's it, it, we hope it's it can be repaired but at this moment tensions exist you the ukrainian jewish community i'm assuming would like the russian jews to stand up and say help our jews in ukraine on the other hand they must understand that the jews in russia can't come out against their own government i think they do I think they do, but it also continues to cause uh, heartburn. And in the midst of this war that's being fought, what's the situation in terms of anti-Semitism against the Jewish community of Ukraine? The, the Jewish community is as integrated in Ukraine as it has ever been, but that doesn't mean that anti-Semitism isn't a concern. 
Fortunately, most of the incidents that have taken place over the last 14, 15 months have been provocations. Most by, well, either by the pro-Russian separatists or others. The government has come out and has been fully supportive of the Ukrainian Jewish community and the pursuit of those who have engaged in anti-Semitic behavior. We only see that continuing. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something unique where, where the Ukrainian Jewish community feels comfortable. But Ellie, the one thing that I tell every audience that I speak to, because I don't want to sound like I'm naive, there, there has been anti-Semitism in Ukraine, there is anti-Semitism in Ukraine, and there will be anti-Semitism in Ukraine. But the difference today is that the government uh, is trying to address the issue in a way that previous governments haven't. Going after those who engaged in these types of, types of activities, trying to explain to the overall population that uh, they need to be pluralistic, tolerant, and that anti-Semitism is unacceptable. In local finance, the shekel today ended the trading week with a mixed performance. And due to the closure of the stock market on Fridays, here's a look at the closing numbers for the week. to the weather and tomorrow we can expect fair conditions and a slight rise in temperatures along with strong northerly winds along the coast. Here's the forecast home and abroad over the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow, and I'll be back at this desk. I'm Aaron Viner, wishing you a wonderful evening, and Shabbat Shalom from Jerusalem.